Previously on Retro Import Review, I reviewed the 1995 arcade flight simulator Ace Combat. Namco's first console game about flailing around in the skies was well received at the time, and by me, for its decent control, varied gameplay and mission variety, and soundtrack. Not everyone was especially delighted, however. One of Ace Combat's planners, Masanori Kato, was especially dissatisfied with how the original turned out. The team felt like there were a lot of areas in the game's development that could have been improved, but didn't really have the chance to do so at the time. When I said the PlayStation wasn't well understood in 1995, I wasn't wrong. Namco set out to understand the console much more thoroughly before beginning this new instalment, like how many polygons they can display at one time, and how to make the game play closer to its arcade forefathers. With that in mind, let's get on with it. Last time out, we reviewed Ace Combat. This time out, we're reviewing its 1997 sequel, Ace Combat 2. With Ace Combat 2, the name of the game here is Evolution. The aim here was to improve every single aspect over the original. Whilst the original was a good starting point for the series, it's still only the first go at the concept on console. Developing Ace Combat 2, the team had the aim of getting as much power out of the console as they could, improving the gameplay, giving things an even greater variety than before, and giving the graphics more appeal. Because of this, we have to go into this game seeing it as both a sequel and its own thing. Does Ace Combat 2 improve things enough to make the original game redundant, or does it get too high on its own supply? Well, reviews at the time regard it as a marked improvement over the original Ace Combat, with graphics, gameplay and variety being targets of that praise, although criticism tended to be directed at different things depending on the reviewer. With the praise it got though, you'd imagine it sold several millions, right? Well, sort of? It didn't sell millions plural, but it did sell 1.1 million units over the years through to 2008. Compared to the 2.25 million units Ace Combat shifted, it was a little bit disappointing, but it didn't deter Namco much, as we'll see soon. For now, however, we should move on to looking at the game, so let's start with the packaging. When I reviewed the original Ace Combat, I noted that the packaging looked simple, with its decently well-composed cover, but otherwise functional presentation. It would for what it was, even if it wasn't anything amazing. So comparing the packaging for Ace Combat with Ace Combat 2 is virtually night and day. Where the original had a simply composed cover, the sequel had a cleaner, much more unique cover design. We have a line art rendition of a Sukhoi Su-35, and I know that because it says it in the corner and I googled it. It reminds me of the Wipeout cover with its wireframe craft being key to the cover's composition. The logo feels a bit more tastefully done, too. I was never a fan of the colour choice of the original, but the gradated red works a lot nicer, I reckon. It's cleaner and less of the 1990s, where colours tended to be thrown around like confetti. Not that it's the most egregious example ever, but all the same. Let's go over the back of the box, where we are greeted by a number of fairly small images. I feel like there could have been a little bit more they could have done here to make the images slightly larger, even if it meant using only 6 instead of 8. At least there's some clarity to them. Also, this obi is pretty nice with how it replaces the barcode on the back with… another barcode, but also an aircraft and stylishly written game name. This is definitely more for the front than the back. Anyway, inside we have the game disc and a few slips of paper to look at. Removing the game disc momentarily shows us a very stylish render on the reverse of the back cover, with some text near the bottom. It's pretty novel. The first of the papery stuff is a survey card, typical stuff for Namco or really any big Japanese game maker at the time. The second is a small promotional leaflet advertising a guidebook for Ace Combat 2, as well as numerous games and peripherals that you can buy- Oh hello there, Nejikon! And now, the manual. The original game's manual was filled from top to bottom with information, whereas this one lets the content breathe a bit. Rather than everything being crammed in, it's spaced out in such a way that makes it a little easier on the eyes and easier to follow. I also can't help but think that the manual's general design was influenced by a certain animated television series that served as the core of Japan's cultural zeitgeist during the 1990s. 
I wonder. Anyway, the manual here is very good. It's not great if you're not familiar with Japanese, but there's a few images here and there that demonstrate things, and if you know hiragana, you can use that to translate everything here thanks to it having furigana all over the kanji. It's pretty handy, really. So enough of all that, it's time for us to take to the skies for the second time. Ace Combat 2 is go! Starting up Ace Combat 2 gives us a few things to look at, although some of them get obscured with the changing resolutions. I'll touch on that when it's appropriate, but we soon see a full motion video sequence showing aircraft launching off a carrier to engage in combat in the skies. The presentation carries a fair few changes here, but it also helps to showcase Namco's abilities in making use of computer-generated graphics to produce a good-looking cutscene to start things up. Anyway, we're going to start the game up. Normal difficulty again, and we are thrust into an introductory sequence similar to what came before with Ace Combat. A commanding officer explains the situation to us and urges us to do something about it. Being an ace pilot for hire, we oblige and aim to eliminate the threat of these terrorists by the means available to us. That is, getting in these beasts of aerial supremacy. So let's have a look at what's going on. We see the overworld map and a few screens open to us. For now, let's head over to the mission we have available to us to receive a briefing and run through the mission plan. The way these are presented is really nice and makes good use of what the PlayStation can do for 3D even if it's somewhat rudimentary. Once again, we can ask for further information on our targets and anything else that may be in the mission's environment. It all works in much the same way as before, and once we're done with that, we can pick a craft from our roster and fly to the skies. The original Ace Combat's general gameplay applies much the same here, to put things simply, but going from Ace Combat to Ace Combat 2, you'll notice a good number of changes that make the experience quite a bit more interesting. You'll start each mission heading off into the area of engagement, before picking off the targets you need to and going back to base in the end. The process hasn't changed, but the way the game handles it definitely has. So without repeating myself too much, let's talk about the controls. The layout from before is exactly the same here, but there is some nuance here, because this game allows you to remap the face buttons however you want. If you want your missiles on the triangle button and guns on the square button, you can do that. Whilst I personally don't make use of this kind of feature, I'd rather it was here anyway since it allows the player to tailor their experience to their own preferences and abilities. Accessibility features are good. Also helping this game's accessibility is its controller compatibility. Much like Ace Combat before it, it supports the original PlayStation controller and the Negicon but it also supports the PlayStation Analog Stick, a joystick peripheral that works really well with arcade games and flight simulators. We're not playing with any of that though, we're playing with the DualShock controller. Well, DualShock 2 specifically, because if I'm going to have a DualShock controller, I may as well have the one that works across basically everything. Using analog controls makes this kind of game quite a bit more playable than it was before, simply because the analog control provides you with quantifiably more finesse than you got from a simple D-pad, and you have free settings for just how responsive you'd like the controls to be. It's what makes my playing this game using the expert control scheme possible for me, because rather than feeling like I'm freebirding my way into the danger zone, it's possible for me to pretend to be controlled in my manoeuvres. I did feel like I was flopping about as I was playing for a brief while, but it took surprisingly little time for me to eventually adjust. After enough time, it became pretty much normal. So now that I've gone over the controls and what's actually different here, I'm going to go into the gameplay and the specifics of things, because going into Ace Combat 2 two years after the original, you'll notice there's a few changes here, so let's go through them. Firstly, touching briefly back on the controls for a moment, things feel a lot more fluid compared to before. The original game's use of digital controls felt somewhat resistive, there was a sense that the game was pushing back against you. It felt fine for what it was at the time, but the most satisfyingly controllable game it ain't. Ace Combat 2 makes things feel so much more smooth thanks to the refinement that comes from two years of understanding the technology powering the games you're making, and that refinement keeps on going the older the console gets. So anyway, what do you actually do in Ace Combat 2? 
Well, it can be simply answered by saying you do much the same stuff you did in the original Ace Combat, which, for all intents and purposes, was shooting down enemy targets. The makeup of the majority of the missions follows this formula, and it can seem somewhat same old, same old. But Ace Combat 2 does make a few changes to the minutia within the missions. For a start, in some missions you will have non-targets, entities within missions, usually buildings and structures, that could be targeted, but you really don't want to do that if you want the best rewards. If you're locked onto them, don't fire and set your lock on to something else. Another addition is the clear distinction between objective targets and optional targets. On your radar you'll see either red or white targets, with red targets being your objectives and white targets being optional. You don't need to fight them, but you'll get more money from them. On top of this is the new addition of Aces, enemy pilots that tend to be much more competent pilots compared to what you were fighting already. They're more reactive to your own manoeuvres, and more capable of taking you on in a one-on-one -on -one dogfight. I'll talk about the rewards you get for them shortly. The variety of the missions as well has changed. The original had some interestingly varied missions, but this one takes a variety up to 11 in ways that I very much appreciate. Mission 10, Rising High, introduces the idea of missions that take place above cloud level, requiring you to fly at speed to avoid stalling. Missions like these can be pretty tricky since you have to be mindful of the fact that the more you keep off the throttle, the more likely you are to stall. Other missions, like Visiting Hours, require you to fly into a confined space in order to eliminate a core target. This mission in particular provides you with a strict time limit as well to add to the tension. There are even missions which require you to protect certain targets in battle, lest you fail the mission. And there are even missions that make your radar unreliable and essentially ineffective. Without spoiling more of the variety on offer, I'll also mention that some missions will have an additional element on them after you finish them. You get an opportunity to land your craft. They can be particularly difficult if you're not used to coming into land. Indeed, I crashed pretty much any time I tried to land on a carrier. My only real issue with this is it took me by surprise the first time I had to do this. It's not bad or anything, I just wish I had more awareness of this. At the end of a mission, you'll be given a rundown of enemy targets destroyed, and how much damage you've taken, if any. You'll be given a payout based on all of this, and compared to the sums you got before, the prices are a lot more balanced this time out. So let's talk about the stuff you can do with that money. Hanging around in the hangar, you'll be able to buy the different aircraft you get access to by completing missions. The progression path is much the same as it was in the original, but with a few differences, although you do ultimately unlock more powerful aircraft as you finish more missions. Similar to the original game, aircraft are given different rankings at the bottom, this time with seven different aspects. Power, defense, mobility, stability, climbing ability, air-to-air, -air, and air-to-ground. You'll also be informed of whether your craft is a stealth fighter or not, or pretty self-explanatory. You can earn more money by taking down the aces in missions. Alongside that, however, you unlock medals to signify you're eliminating them, and you come out of these missions with more awareness of your own abilities, by realising that spamming your missiles is a quick way to end up with no missiles. Throughout your campaign, you will be given the military rank as a mark of your progress. You don't actually gain any sort of prize from this, other than the ability to say you beat the game at such and such a rank. It's just one of those things that exists but doesn't have much of a use otherwise. And now for a few things I didn't yet touch on, such as losing your aircraft. In the original Ace Combat, if you crashed or were shot down, you would have to buy that aircraft brand new, as aircraft were treated more like arcade game lives than anything. Ace Combat 2 takes a different approach, however. Instead of requiring you to buy the aircraft again, you will pay for a replacement provided by the military for a reduced cost. I think you end up paying a tenth of the full cost for a replacement. This probably changes based on difficulty, but I cannot confirm. It does trivialise things a little bit, as the reduced cost is a lot easier to manage overall, in spite of the money you get being a bit more restrained by comparison to the original, but at the very least, it's not overly punishing. It's not a simple arcade game anymore, so using a live system doesn't make a ton of sense. It can lead to some weird situations, however. For example, in the missions where you are expected to land your craft as the mission is done, 
you can complete the mission, crash your craft, and despite the penalty of crashing your craft, still get the rewards for finishing the mission. At least you don't have to redo the mission, I suppose. It doesn't even have to be something like that, either. Finishing the mission Sentinel, in which you have to use your guns to shoot down satellite towers, resulted in me crashing into a cliff when control was taken away from me. It's stupid, but I must admit it was incredibly funny seeing that happen. Despite the weirdness, though, the systems that are in place for Ace Combat 2 are much improved, and one such example is with the Wingmen. This time around, after Mission 3, you get a choice between Saul Hudson and David Howell at oh, I'm sorry, I mean Slash and Edge. Anyway, you only get two wingmen to choose from this time, but to compensate, you also get more options on how to direct them in missions, which in turn gives them a different aircraft suited for that role, and they do a generally good job of doing what you tell them to. I don't tend to notice them, but that's better than being obviously bad, I guess. If you tell them to keep the airspace around the targets clear, they'll do what they can to clear enemies away. If you tell them to follow you and protect you, they'll do it. If you tell them to go ham and take on enemy craft, they'll do it. For now though, I want to get into the presentation aspects. I'll save the progression stuff for later. For now, we need to talk about the visuals and how much of an improvement they are on the original Ace Combat. There can be no understatement with this, Ace Combat 2 looks significantly better in comparison to the original game. It would be folly to argue against this, and in pretty much every way you can imagine the visuals improving, Namco did it. To start out with the most obvious change, the presentation is much cleaner and more taut. It feels less like an arcade game grafted onto a console, and more like a game that knows what it is and what platform it's targeted for. There's an assuredness to it all which allows the game to work. The UI and general presentation outside of missions is so much nicer to look at. The clear green on black terminal visual style helps things be easy to navigate and read, and menus are nicely laid out. They are much better optimised compared to the original Ace Combat. Actually, now that I've mentioned it, let's talk briefly about the language requirements. There is only one situation where Japanese comes in handy, and that's in missions when receiving communications from your wingman since hearing the relevant voice line can be pretty tricky at times. Other than that, the entirety of the game is playable in English, with all of the mission text, menu text, and spoken dialogue being in English. Perhaps the best thing with this, though, is that the English in the game is genuinely good English. It doesn't feel awkward like you might expect of a Japanese game of the era. Such is an example of how forward-thinking Namco were in the day, because Ace Combat 2's tricks don't stop there. The in-mission UI also received a bit of an overhaul, with bits of information showcased in a generally better way to how it was in the original game. Whilst I still question the idea of fuel being in the opposite corner to where the missiles are, at least it's a much clearer way of showing to the player how much fuel they have in a mission, and the missile count number being bigger helps. The radar screen comes with a new layout of sorts, with scanning range being highlighted at the bottom, as well as marks to indicate your cone of vision which is especially useful for tracking enemies. Warning messages are also much clearer this time. They pop up bold and easy to see, and they give you time to react without you worrying too much about it. There's also the sound effects inherent with all this, but we'll touch on those soon. The one foible with this UI is that it can sometimes lose contrast. Against certain colours, the UI can become hard to read, which in one respect isn't too bad, as you have the radar to refer to for enemies, but the faster pace in this game demands a rapid-fire brain, and the game not clearly giving you the information you need isn't ideal. As for other graphical aspects, the 3D work has improved leaps and bounds. The weird white, orange and purple livery, although an aesthetic in itself, is gone and replaced with much more straight-laced militaristic greens, greys and browns. All of these have been liveried onto aircraft that have many more details compared to before. They're much closer in appearance to their real-life counterparts, and show off the development team's greater understanding of what they had under them. It's a genuine graphical evolution. The environments as well look much better. Ace Combat's environments did the job they needed to do, communicate to the player what things are and let the player fill in the gaps. Ace Combat 2 does that job whilst filling in the gaps on its own. Textures are much more detailed, giving bodies of water the look of… well, water instead of a sheet of blue card with a few creases in it. 
Landmass also carries more detail. Urban areas and cities have more buildings with a few more details this time around. There are weather effects in some missions. The list could go on, really. However, there are a couple other visual problems with the game. Once again, I am here to report that this game continues the tried and true resolution switching the original game does, where missions are in 240p and more or less everything else is in 480i. This time around, however, things are a lot less messy. Screens aren't weirdly offset, unlike last time, and even with my OSSC handling interlaced sources somewhat weirdly, it doesn't seem to have any problems accommodating for this. Also, the game runs at a nice and consistent 30 frames per second in missions, but I have encountered a couple sharp hitches which can affect things. They are just momentary issues, thankfully, but those can either make or break a mission for you. I do want to end this section on graphics by making mention of the pre-rendered cinematics, though. The intro FMV is especially gorgeous to look at. Namco were really on a tear with their pre-rendered graphics by this point, and constant improvement was the norm for them. In any case, Ace Combat 2 is a significantly better looking game over the original. Where the original felt more function over form, this one feels like form on top of function. And it works all the better for it. For now though, I must move on to the audio side of things, as I've rambled on about how the game looks for too long already. Going from Ace Combat to Ace Combat 2, the general quality and style of the audio here has improved a great deal, albeit with some slight drawbacks. Not anything game-breaking or problematic as such, but I do think they bring things down a little. Firstly, let's talk about the sound effects. The sort of sound effects you had in the past are back, but sound a bit meatier and more impactful. Missile hits sound stronger, warning sounds are a bit louder and more prominent, and the stuff that was annoying in the first game is less annoying here. Really, that last bit is the biggest improvement for me. Instead of being told five times in a row that you've been damaged, you are instead given a single warning when it happens. I find it more effective and it allows me to focus on staying alive. I appreciate it. Once again, there's voice acting, and this time, whilst there's still the issue of one voice line for the different things that can happen, the number of things that can happen has gone up enough to not really draw much attention to that. All told, it's pretty competent, I would say, if sometimes tricky to hear in missions. The commanding officer here is different this time around, voiced by... Uh, somebody putting on a weird Southern US accent. I actually can't find much to do with the voice actors used here, unlike the original game, and that's a bit bizarre to me. Not giving people credit really has stood the test of time, huh? That having been said, I'm not super fond of this performance. Compared to Daniel Dresner's performance as the commanding officer in the original, I didn't get the sense of concise urgency here. It felt like someone was focusing on sounding more like someone from the American South than an actual commanding officer. Whether that's down to the talent or the direction, I cannot say. Either way, I find myself pointing towards this as being one of the few things that I say are a step down from the original game, even if the audio does improve overall. Anyhow, it's time to go on towards the soundtrack. Ace Combat's soundtrack was pretty good with some high energy tracks that works really well for the mood it was going for. Ace Combat 2 soundtrack does much the same, but with higher fidelity and with a better selection of tracks overall. You have tracks that are exciting and adventurous like Aim High, Fire Away and Rising High. You have somewhat more jazzy tracks like On The Sly and Aerial Hawk. You have electronic forward tracks like Dead End and Meltdown. And you have one of the most 1990s tracks I've heard in a video game, Dynapolis. I kinda love it. A couple of the tracks, most notably Night and Day, are rearrangements of tracks from the original Ace Combat soundtrack. And I would say the newer music, done by Nobuhide Isayama, Kota Takahashi, Hiroshi Okubo, and Tetsukazu Nakanishi, along with much of the sound, is quite a bit better overall. The increase in variety, in concert with the improvement in sound quality, enables the soundtrack to do a better job by comparison to the original. And even though I suck at explaining exactly why, the music in context explains it on its own. The only real downside with the music here, in spite of all the positives that surround it, is that it doesn't loop properly. I don't entirely know why, but every time the music is about to loop, it plays about one second of whatever the next track is in the sequence before correcting itself and repeating the track it played initially. Here, listen for yourself. Here's a sequence where the track ends, 
but is then followed up by a brief snippet of another track before looping back around on the one it played originally. It's as if someone was scrambling for the previous track button on the CD player after realising the track was ending. It's really strange and I'm not entirely sure why it does that. It's the other thing that I find to be a negative with the game's sound work, because it doesn't really make sense as to how it's like this. There's very probably some mundane explanation behind it. Maybe it's how the PlayStation streams its audio or something. Either way, it causes a strange problem with the game's soundtrack that is otherwise really good. With all of this having been said, the audio in Ace Combat 2 is an improvement on what came before, even if it comes with a few strings attached. And now I think it would be best to cover the progression in this game before we begin to wrap things up. The way in which Ace Combat 2's progression is structured differs quite a bit from the original game in quite a number of ways. First of all, you don't have access to missions out of order. Instead, you go through them in a linear order. The upshot of this is it gets rid of the awkward map that the original had, but it does mean that your campaign can be reduced down to being a string of missions all the way to the end. Though this isn't strictly true, certain missions are unlockable and require you to perform certain actions to access them. For example, in the third mission, City on Fire, you need to take down two of the transport ships in order to unlock a fork in the road. If you so choose, you can take on the mission Opera House, which sends you out to bring down an offshore oil facility. Such is just one example of the missions you can choose to take on, but later on, there's an even bigger diversion. After mission 16, Power Play, in which you have to take down the enemy structures at a hydro power plant, you are given a choice to take one of two operations, Alphaville or Bellissima, and each one comes with its own different missions, taking place in very different locations and with very different objectives. These choices the player gets to make do help give the campaigns a little bit more longevity and replayability, I would say. They provide more stuff to do, even if, in many respects, they involve doing much the same stuff you already were doing. But I'm fine with doing a little bit more of a fun thing, if it's my own decision in the end. After five missions whittling down the enemy's infrastructure and ability to cope with the losses, you enter the end game, which means it's time for me to delve into spoilers. So if you don't want this game spoiled, then be sure to skip ahead to the conclusion chapter. So, Jewel Box. You're sent to cripple the infrastructure in an urban area so that the enemy can't use the roads as makeshift runways. Of course, we can take care of it, as well as the enemy aircraft and all of that. There is one runway available and we go ahead and land on it once we've done the mission. This leads us straight into Kingpin, the mission that takes us right to the enemy's heart. Taking on the many enemies and ground targets can get tricky, and it's fairly easy to get overwhelmed if you're not careful but your missiles are just too damn handy against all of the everything. Blowing up the enemy HQ means we've done it. We've saved this continent and now we can go home and put our feet up. Or at least we would have done if we had gotten the normal ending in this game. So uh, earlier on, you know how I made mention of the aces you can take down in missions? Well, there's a particular group of aces that you can take care of called Zone of Endless. So we have Zone of Endless and we have Zone of the Enders. Which is it? Make up your damn minds. Anyway, throughout the game you can encounter five of these particular aces, each one being harder to take down than the last thanks in no small part to their crafts getting better than the one from before. However, these aces are generally optional. All you really get from beating these things are medals. So be sure to take down the Zoe pilot in Kingpin to unlock the final two missions of the game. I do appreciate that something like this is in the game, even if it isn't made immediately clear what doing these optional objectives actually entails, like the transport ships from earlier. Since we didn't get the normal ending in my playthroughs here, I'm simply stuck with the final two missions, beginning with Last Resort. Surprise! The enemy had all of this in mind and opted to get on a submarine and get out of dodge. This leads you to take on a submarine, which is rather oddly situated above water. Surely you'd think they'd stay under it, no? Yeah, either way. We eliminate the guns and missiles on it and do some damage to the- Hey, wait, what's this now? For whatever reason, the submarine just shot at a missile that is trying to fly... somewhere. And this is where your ability to control your craft is truly put to the test. Because this can't be locked onto, 
it's too fast for you to just cruise along and it's going to move around a bit. So aiming with your guns is absolutely essential. Taking it down ends the mission, but heading back to base, we realise there is a secondary enemy headquarters at the Fortress Intolerance. You begin the final mission, Fighter's Honor, destroy the power plants, destroy the control towers, ward off the ceaselessly spawning F-15s, and fly right into an enclosed space to destroy the missile within the base, and with that, you have completed the campaign. And credits. But what do we get now that we've beaten the campaign? Well, you get an extra campaign. It's like the main campaign, but extra. And by that I mean you get to play through it again, but this time with a different set of aircraft available to you as you progress through the game. You even start out with a MiG. This doesn't really offer up much more content than the original campaign, so much as it just gives you the opportunity to do a clean sweep if you hadn't already been able to get some things done. But with different equipment. Still, I appreciate that it gives the player another way to try things out. You even get access to a fictional craft, the XFA-27. It is the most expensive aircraft in the game at a cool half million. It is the only fictional craft the player gets access to, and it is perfect in every way except in terms of stability. As such, it can be a bit weird to pilot for the first time, but you almost don't want anything else. Completing this extra campaign nets us the ability to choose whichever mission we want to take on. That said though, we've exhausted most of this game's content and I think it's best that we wrap this review up now. After all of that, I have come away with a much better idea of what to expect going forward in my journey with this series. The original Ace Combat was already a pretty good game given I didn't have many expectations in playing it, but it's difficult to ignore just how much of a step forward Ace Combat 2 is. The speed of the gameplay, the control options available to the player, the way progression is set up, and the general presentation are all marked steps up compared to what was here before. The only things that are slight downgrades are a couple aspects of the audio, but even then it's a net improvement in that department. It's fairly similar to going from Tekken to Tekken 2, where the original was a pretty interesting experiment whereas the second game solidified it and turned it into a genuinely great game. Ace Combat 2 is firmly in that territory now, where it took what the original did, but evolves the game in a substantial way. With all that being said, what does that leave me with regards to the original Ace Combat? Well, I still think it's a pretty good game, and with no other frame of reference available to me at the time, I didn't know what to expect with Ace Combat 2. But ultimately, playing Ace Combat 2 leaves me with the opinion that unless you insist on playing the games in released order, the original Ace Combat can be readily skipped. Because even though it's an interesting artifact for its time, it doesn't stop it from inevitably being the lesser game in the end. Now, I should make mention of the remake this game received back in 2011 for the Nintendo 3DS, called Ace Combat Assault Horizon Legacy. It effectively tries to integrate the game into the series canon by updating the story and lore whilst updating the gameplay for modern audiences. It generally reviewed well, with a review score of 71 on Metacritic, and the user score is reasonably positive as well, sitting at 7.4, in contrast to the actual Ace Combat Assault Horizon, which is between 5.9 and 6.8 with many negative reviews. Legacy might be an option if you're interested, but since I haven't played it, I can't say for certain. And now to touch on importability and language requirements. I'll talk about the latter first. You do not need to know Japanese in order to play this game. Every single piece of critical information is in English, and the entire interface is very English forward. It also helps that a significant amount of text in the game is voiced in English, and whilst the audio can be a little tricky to understand in missions, you don't really need to worry about missing anything remotely important. As for importability, there are a good number of copies available from Japan, and the game is generally pretty cheap, going for usually no more than 500 yen unless it comes with the obi, in which case it may cost a little more but not significantly so. As mentioned in the Ace Combat review, you'll be able to pick up all three PlayStation 1 games as a bundle from some sellers for roughly 
They are not expensive games in Japan and are pretty easily acquired. Over here, if you want to buy Ace Combat 2, PAL copies tend to be in the region of £20 on eBay, which is a pretty decent amount of money to be spending on a game like this, but I do think you could do far worse than that. If I were collecting PAL games, I doubt I'd be thinking twice about buying it. In the US, things tend to be a bit weird, as NTSC copies tend to be going for notably more. Hell, a loose disc copy lists for $27. The few box copies that there are on eBay tend to be north of $40, which is quite a lot, and that's the cheapest because most of the copies I've seen are in free figure territory. As such, if you want this game and if you're based in the United States, I would be giving every consideration to picking up the Japanese copy and finding some way to play it if you wanted to own this game. And really, if you're interested in flight simulator games, I would be considering picking up this game anyway. Ace Combat 2 is a very good game, a definite improvement on its predecessor, and showcases what Namco were capable of when they got a proper understanding of the PlayStation. And with that, thank you very much for watching this review of Ace Combat 2. Barring any unusual happenings, the next review should be of the third game in the series, Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere. I have been told to expect things to get weird. If you enjoyed this review, then please check out my other reviews, like the one before this of the original Ace Combat. And if you have any suggestions of what I ought to cover, please let me know, I'm open to basically anything. Now, ordinarily, I would be recommending for you to check out my website, DanielLearMath.com, but right now there isn't much to see. I'm currently working on making a brand new site after moving hosts, so be sure to keep an eye out there. In the meantime, if you want to keep up to date with anything that I'm up to, there's my Twitter in the description, and there's also my Instagram for whenever I can be bothered to post on there. As ever though, this has been Daniel Learmouth. Sidi. What do you mean they're related?